You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Hey, I'm Saham Ali, the Director of Technology at Falcons. We're introducing something a little new to the podcast. A lot of our team members have the opportunity to participate in interviews and events as guest speakers, and we'd like to share those discussions and audio recordings with our listeners. So, this is our first podcast special event of Experience Imagination, featuring my interview with Pixel Fondue, in which we discuss all the cool new things happening at SIGGRAPH 2018. Thanks to all the folks at Pixel Fondue, especially Greg, for giving us the permission to use the audio of our conversation. Hope you enjoy our first podcast special event. Greg here from Pixel Fondue. I've got Saham Ali from uh, Falcon Media Group. Creative Group Media Group. Falcon's Creative Group. Creative Group. And uh, introduced to me by William Vaughn uh, yesterday. They had met, uh, they're both in Orlando, and uh, I'm sure the 3D community is small enough where they've crossed paths a few times. Uh, but he does some really cool stuff, and it's actually a different application of 3D than some of the people we've been talking to. You guys do big time airplane editing <laughs> exhibits. This is the greatest place ever for interviews, minus the propeller-based airplanes <laughs> over there. I guess maybe quieter than jet engines. But um, so you guys do some really cool stuff. You guys do big creative installations. Yeah. Uh, so you, when you think of Orlando, of course, you think Disney World, Epcot, stuff like that. But you guys do stuff all over the world. Yep. And you're not just doing the um, like the 3D motion ride. You're actually architecting these things sometimes from the ground up. Yeah. Um, it's it's a, actually a really fairly involved process. Uh, you know, we got to make sure that. Whatever is being created is economically going to work out. Enough people are seeing it. So everything from just making sure, uh, you know, the the queue is entertaining enough and we can get people uh, to experience a really, you know, holistic uh, uh, experience, you know, everything from the story to the technology to the media. um, Right. It's it's all planned out. So there's a possibility maybe a client comes to you and say, okay, we're looking at a new uh, uh, avatar uh, you know, ride or something like that, and we are going to just to do an exploratory budget. We want you guys to start helping us with planning because maybe this won't even happen sure. if, if you guys decide, like, you know what, you're not going to be able to get enough people through here to like keep make this ride viable. But there's probably some early process like that before you move on to the actual planning stage. I'm guessing. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, you know, a lot of it's story, it's narrative, right? So uh, we got to make sure that what the client actually wants, where they can actually convey. Uh, And we'll do many exploratory exercises of, uh, we could do it this way or that way, uh, end result being the same, but uh, you know, it really comes down to obviously the the client's needs and uh, where, you know, like sometimes space isn't an option, you know, and sometimes right. you're just limited by things that are out of your control. Nothing, not even money can fix it. So, so you've got some probably some some artists there to draw up some early concepts. You've probably got some writers on staff there to uh, write out some uh, themes and things like that to work with the client, and then eventually that moves on down to the creative people. Um, now, do you are. <laughs> I guess you're doing a lot of things because you may be doing, are you doing actual uh, ArchViz type work in addition to VFX type work? Yeah, totally. Like uh, we're, we're pretty involved. Uh, you know, it's been a convergence in the last few years, but definitely, you know, uh, from the design side where it used to just start out on paper, you know, uh-huh. everything's digital, uh, but you know, we'll iterate through a bunch of designs really quickly, you know, maybe Photoshop, uh, but then uh, we'll start massing, you know, and that's when it starts to look 3D and we start to see how uh, sight lines look on uh, the, the features of these buildings and, and, and facades. So, uh, but then the digital media side is almost always involved now in the sense that uh, we have to, uh, you know, like take it up a notch. Uh, now we're, you know, able to provide full VR experiences. Uh, to our clients, which normally before, you know, you just have to look at a sketch. And so never so give us an example project that you've worked on so we can sort of wrap our heads around this a little bit. So uh, maybe uh, an existing, if you can talk about it, like an existing uh, ride or experience that you guys worked on and how that process worked. Sure. Um, I think the most recent one I could speak of would be uh, we just wrapped uh, Bush Gardens Battle for uh, Ear Ire. Bush Gardens in uh, Williamsburg uh, in Virginia. Williamsburg, Virginia. So yep. is this Civil War related? No, no. Uh, it's it's uh, it's actually like Celtic, <laughs> Irish, Celtic. Yeah, yeah okay. it's, it's it's you really gotta check it out. Um, but you know, we we were we were approached with this uh-huh. concept and we saw it through everything from the story okay. of what this is going to be. Uh, to you know, many many iterations of what characters are going to be like that you know uh, is part of this lore, okay. uh, and then uh, to the entire experience of uh, you know how how this is going to work. And uh, this was uh, Falcon's first, uh, technically I would say, world industry first. It was a, a 
head mounted, you know, like VR, uh -huh. uh, but on a 60 person motion base. So you've got 60 people on this was like a ship. Uh, it, so ride? <laughs> well, yeah, you're on a ride. Okay. Uh, you're, and you're wearing goggles. And you're wearing goggles. Okay. Uh, but you're you're in another world. You're in another world. Yeah. So it's also motion based. You've got. I, I'm gonna relate this to the Star Wars ride at Disney World because a lot of people have probably been on that, where you you get on the Star Wars ride, you're not wearing goggles, you see a screen, but you've got motion based with the motion on the screen. Sure. But you're doing this, but with. Full VR. VR and motion. Yeah, it must be crazy. It is. Uh, it's quite intense, and you know, a lot of uh, choreography between uh, how you produce the media and how you can, you know, work with physics right. in, in real life to make you feel sensations that you've never felt before. Uh, are you know? So uh, how do you iterate through that? Is this like okay, too much? People are throwing up. What's not dialing back? We, we start with it. the baseline of you know camera path, and okay. we, we kind of we work from there, and then we'll we'll get creative with it during the process to okay. make things a little bit more exciting. Well, what sort of software comes into play uh, when you're doing these things? Well, uh, I mean, you know, we we use just about anything anything that needs to be used to get the job done. Uh, we're primarily Maya, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, for modeling even, uh, and then you know compositing is. We're, we're a nuke, you know, to use nuke as well. So you guys do essentially sort of high-end visual effects for the ride aspect of it. It sounds like I mean, it seems like probably a similar pipeline. Yeah, we we in some ways uh, probably push the bar a little bit further than um, uh, you know for film VFX in the sense that uh, we can't cheat when we do our experiences and uh, right. you know it's 360. Uh, right. Primarily, that a lot is, of our format is uh, VR and full dome. So. Yeah, if you've ever created content for VR, um, it is a, it's day and night when you're dealing with 360 yeah. uh, environments because you're used to like filling up. Even an HD screen is sometimes a wide, hard to fill up. Yep. It, it, it's like whatever eight times the data when you have to do a 360 view. And uh, you probably work with large uh, resolutions as well in some of the stuff. Like, what do you, do you yeah, have, like, I giant mean, screens or multiple multi-panel displays? It, again, it comes down to the installation budgets and, and you know, constraints. But, uh, you know, we, we've done uh, stereo 8K. We've done story, stereo 10K. We've, uh, the, the numbers keep growing, yeah, and it really uh, comes down to how, how crazy, <laughs> you know. And then and then high frame rate, that's uh, that's the stuff that's All right. starting high to frame happen. Rate as so, well. so if uh, you're rendering out of uh, Maya or whatever, you're dealing with... Uh, massive output. So stereo 8K. So do you guys use a render service, or do you guys have? Uh, we have our own. We have our own uh, 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 render farm that I've built uh, over the last few years. Uh, it's uh, fairly sizable. We're, uh, you know, are you rendering CPU or GPU? We we are GPU. Uh, are uh, GPU? We're we're probably one of the very few shops that are uh, full GPU. What render engine are you using? Uh, we are Redshift. Oh, Redshift. You know, I haven't had a chance to talk to those guys. They're down at the show floor. Um, renowned for its speed and uh, yeah, GP rendering. And yeah, it's uh, we've worked very closely with them. It's actually a quite amazing product. Um, it's grown leaps since we've yeah. adopted it, uh, but it's an ex extremely fast, extremely fast render. And I'm a huge fan of GPUs. Right. So the the technology in itself is really uh, impressive. Of what you want to, what we can now achieve. Uh, what used to take. Days yeah. for a frame, we can get down a lot. lot it, it's faster. pretty, it's pretty amazing. And we were dealing with something like 8K or even 4K, 8K, stereo 4K. Even um, one of the issues is is pixel density, right? And, yeah. and we talked about this a little bit before, where I've done exhibits um, with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and some scientific institutes, and uh, I've actually Epcot Center I've worked with before too. And you have to. Um, be uh, really aware of how close the viewer is going to get to the screen because 8K seems like a lot, but we're talking about pixel density because if you have a 10 foot screen yeah. and if you were one foot away, all of a sudden 8K is not that much because you can see the pixels. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to deal with that as well. Yeah, we 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 work all that out very very closely in the beginning just to ensure uh, that's not an issue. It's it's kind of our approach. We, yeah. we really see the entire process. We deliver a, a, a product that's like refined end to end because we really care about the the audience experience. Yeah, and you, in these sort of custom displays, you can really get into huge resolutions. I'm just remembering what I uh, did um, uh, that was shot on a Red Epic and then at AK, and then they turned it sideways to yeah. get more resolution this way, and then they put, I think, four of them together. Yeah. So it was that many pixels across. And then you're dealing with vast amounts of data. So yeah. it sounds like you're responsible for some of the hardware in the pipeline. Like, so you've got uh, what sort of, I'm just curious because Let's get a little geeky here. What sort of storage um, systems are you using? 10 gigabit Ethernet to get stuff to everybody? Uh, so or? my render farm, uh, it, it itself has a fairly fat trunk uh, to like a, 
they're all giggy, mm -hmm. but uh, we're 40 gig backbone, okay. uh, and that's redundant link across a four node cluster. So okay. everything's served up. So you got some web truck together and going yeah, out. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's pretty sizable. I mean, there's shops that are way bigger, are, but I'm very happy with our cluster in the sense that it it doesn't hiccup yep. and it's got um, incredibly smart analytics uh, behind it that allow us to just kind of get data on the. So floor. you don't have people waiting for for data a lot. Now, I've been kind of surprised. You can probably speak to this a little bit. I really thought 10 gigabit Ethernet would be uh, um, standard on motherboards by now. The switches have come down in price quite a bit. Yeah. It really hasn't, it's starting to show up with some of the higher end stuff. Yeah, it's de well, I mean, it's always going to be the case. Um, whenever these uh, new generations of hardware motherboard chipsets come out, um, there's always the premium elite top end version yeah. of it. And that's where they put all, you know, if you want 10 gig, yeah. I can get, I used to be able to get 10 gig native on a board by uh, the X99 chipset. And that's right. now I yeah. can, and it's pretty common, and it's just becoming more more common. You'll soon it's going to be you'll be able to get fiber built right in onto these motherboards. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that goes. I think uh, you know, but I wired my office uh, Sabertooth with ten gig probably five years ago. Thinking, yeah. okay, like a year, I'll buy a switch. And like, nope, nope, nope. But now you can get like uh, some of the smaller switches. You know, like a ten ports with a small studio, or a thousand bucks, less than a thousand bucks. And uh, some of the higher end boards, the Threadripper boards that I've got in my systems now, they have 10 gig built in, and uh, Intel's bringing that. I think if Apple starts, I think they put popped in 10 gig in the new iMac um, standard. And well, so, I, so I know one of the big drawbacks was um, getting availability of the PCIe lanes on all our machines oh, right, yeah. because 10 gig does consume just that little bit more. And you're using uh, GPU rendering, so yeah, yeah. and it, it, it's thirsty. GPU right. rendering gets very right. thirsty. Right, right. <laughs> so that is a consideration. Yeah. Uh, so have you visited Nvidia, AMD down there, seeing the new GPUs? Oh yeah. Uh, so you think that's striking your? <laughs> yeah, this year I think was really pivotal in computer graphics. I mean. Uh, went to that you know CGL uh, JPL uh, uh, get up and just kind of seeing where they all yeah. came from and where we are today it's really quite incredible and especially what Nvidia unveiled this year yeah uh, I, I don't think really people understand the full grasp of they're bringing back what I mean ray tracing used to be a thing you know right maybe 10 years ago I remember the cards coming out and they just kind of drifted away yeah and now it's back but packaged in such a smart way that Nvidia is now making it like Unbelievable things are going to be able to happen on your desktop home machine. The fact that you know, with machine learning, the the you know that ray tracing engine and all these things kind of coming together, basically unleashing real time. Right. Uh, so the masses. you know they're combining some machine learning into noising algorithms yeah. happening in real time with the ray tracing, and they're sort of uh, breaking down ray tracing a little bit. If you look at some of the, um, I think I, I, their acronyms. RTX maybe is that their is that their API or is it RTR? Yeah, it's our. So the one thing the key takeaway is um, their technology right now they're really showing off is the kind of the rasterization, mm -hmm. right? And but there's path tracers. Path tracers are like V-rays, red shifts, right? right. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, these other technologies that do the film level effects can leverage that. So it's so new. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it's going to help, but just in itself, the AI denoising, that's just massive gains in itself. I don't know if you played around any with that I did, stuff. yeah. Yesterday, it's I like, jumped around a little bit. And uh, so the AI drove by at, at, at O-Toys booth. They have their own version. I uh, looked at NVIDIA's and the, uh, the optics. And then uh, also with the AMD's, got their own denoising algorithm as well. So they're yeah. all AI-based, all machine yeah. learning. And there's multiple AI players. It's that hardware. It's the it's the tensor cores that they're putting on these cards See that, that enable Exactly. This. So so if you're if you're wondering what that is, if you're like starting to get bored with all the geek stuff, tensor cores <laughs> are actually Put on, I think in the Volta, uh, maybe, and, and they're essentially what happened is um, machine learning is very GPU hungry, and NVIDIA started making getting a lot of G, uh, AI clients, right? Machine learning clients and shipping a lot of GPUs just to the AI people. But they, the standard GPU uh, cores uh, for graphics aren't necessarily the best for AI. They've come up with some new technology they've integrated in the cards called Tensor Cores that um, iterate through the sort of AI trees very quickly. Those I've always wondered, like, are those gonna are those any use to graphics people, or are they just gonna be for the AI people? And it sounds like Man. that's doing the the denoising in conjunction with it the graphics. It can stuff. do. Yeah. Um, we're just at the cusp of what you know, programmers, developers, and artists are going to be able to do with this stuff. I mean, this Nvidia shows examples of taking 30 FPS video right. and uprising it to 400,000 FPS, and you can't discern if it wasn't shot native. <laughs> And all those interpolated frames look good. 
So it's interpolating hundreds of frames between one and two frames. Yeah. It's just using machine learning probably yeah. to pick out what, we, a set of vectors. They're showing, they're showing examples where you literally I can take a picture on a phone and slap text all over it, mess it up, make it look like Snapchat, and all of a sudden <laughs> run a filter and I can make up every pixel behind every word. And yeah, you can, you're making me nervous it's, a little and, bit. And that, that, well, this is the, this, these are the realities. These are the repercussions of now, I mean, you get smart enough at being able to understand data sets where you're pulling keys. Yeah. Very soon, I'll be able to say, remove dog. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, know what the dog is. Yeah, I know what the well, dog you is. Even, you wouldn't click, you'll just tell it. Yeah, remove dog. You know, it'll basically <laughs> object ID for live right. motion. Yeah, and so that, that's part of what um, the AI denoising is doing, is it's recognizing objects and what's supposed to be um, separated from you know, the background and the foreground and the background, recognizing yeah. actual objects, and probably probably similar to like self-driving technology or something like that, where it's picking yeah. out different objects. Uh, it's funny, I was talking to the Otoy guy, and he was like, well, this is a super fast now, but just wait, it's a toddler. Like It'll be like in high school next year, and it's going to be blasting through this stuff. Because they feed it more data, feed it more data. Big company like NVIDIA has vast amounts of data. Yeah. Um, it is a little Skynet. It is a little creepy, but um, it's coming whether you like it or not. You still you have to drop some serious coin right now for some of this stuff, but I, I see this stuff will filter down. I mean, you'll be able to get desktop. I mean, I mean the example Nvidia showed, which was I mean, testament. Uh, they showed off that Star Wars demo at GDC. Yep. Four uh, Tesla top end Teslas running that thing, a seventy thousand dollar rig. Yeah. Now the exact same thing runs on a single ten thousand dollar card that can fit into your desktop. Is that the GT? That's the RTX eight thousand. RTX eight thousand. Yeah. It's like ten k. And, uh, but I mean, like, I mean, think about it. This thing has 48 gigs of VRAM on it, and you can couple it and get 96 gig of shared sure, frame. Right. Buffer. So that's the other thing. It's, it's they're doing shared frame buffers with like, is it M NVE link or N something? NV like link. NV link. Yeah. So yes. So that's one of the problems GPU running right now is you may have two Titan 1080 Ti's in there, but you're only getting the RAM from one of them. It's loading the same thing twice. Yeah. Well, that's a limitation in general. Of um, that's how Nvidia kind of splits their right. their, their product line. The GeForce cards will never have the Quadro features of right. NV link and. In, in frame buffer sharing. Now, there's rumors, who knows, but I mean, I But it's doubt. a big deal because you could have multiple cards and you didn't have, you weren't getting the benefit of all that memory. But yep. now you're able to linking up the cards, kind of like an SLI type system, but you're sharing memory between the cards. So, you know, I'm working on a scene in V-Ray right now. I had to go to a uh, CPU because it took, um, you know, over 100 gigs of, of RAM, a lot of texture maps. Yeah. Um, couldn't do that on GPU, but now you're looking at GPU cards with, would you say, 48 gigs of RAM? Well, the thing is, I mean, yeah, the thing is, I mean, it really comes down to the render you decide. It, a lot of it comes down to, you know, you don't have to have as much, I mean, it's good to have all the RAM you can right. get, uh, but out of core processing, it's there to help the mm -hmm. situation where if you don't have that much RAM, but ideally you want as much as you can possibly fit. And a that. AMD was actually showing some tech where they were streaming um, uh, text, you know, back to system RAM from the card yep. when overflowed and, yep. and using it that way. In fact, they have a card, I think, with an SSD glued on there, too, yeah. which wants to share some RAM. So they're solving the salute. They're solving the problems. Those uh, companies are aware of our needs. Um, the NVIDIA stuff, you know, Shane uh, Griffith, the product manager at Moto, uh, came back from that NVIDIA yep. uh, program with his eyes like, <laughs> like this, like, you guys don't understand. You don't understand what this is, you know, it's going to be. It's moving so yeah, fast. You know? It's going to be cool. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see, we'll see some of that filtering down, and uh, it's pretty exciting uh, where that's going. Uh, all right. Is it Seagull, maybe? <laughs> Something attacking us? Uh, all right. Well, anything else jump out of you that you want to chat about before we go? Uh, just really excited. It's a lot of, I mean, this year for me, like the biggest thing was GPUs. Mm -hmm. They're going to change a lot. <laughs> uh, real time's coming, you know, yeah. and we're just inching closer and closer. Well, let me ask you this. So uh, you're doing um, a lot of this stuff, uh, production work. Do you see yourself, instead of doing pre rendered frames for a ride, uh, just doing a real time uh, Unreal Engine? <laughs> <laughs> set up with the quality high enough and the resolution high enough and then maybe that's easier to make to change up if they want to add something to the ride later than having to re-render a whole sequence. So it really comes again down to application. Okay. Um, the the gamification kind of, of everything is definitely leading towards real time. Mm -hmm. Real time to people a lot of times means two different things. Right. As an interesting panel about you know Pixar's view on it versus uh, you know uh, the CTO of Epic Games view on it versus, uh, you know, uh, a, a creative side, there, et cetera. But there's good enough for feedback where the, art, the artists can uh, do it interactively. Yeah, I mean, look, render, right. like, the, okay, so Pixar, they're like, we basically started going toward path tracing in the viewport. Right. Like, 
skip rasterizing, let's just go to path tracing in the viewport, and that's basically final frame rendering. Now that GPU rendering has got so good, they're, they're clustering this type of technology across. That's always been the challenge of uh, GPU rendering. All that data set always has to sit in the one GPU, and now, it's, now I need to let the GPUs communicate one another, but over a network. Right. Now, right, and coordinating that like mass amounts of data is pretty complicated. So, do you see yourself uh, setting up uh, these types of systems as maybe having a rack with uh, eight or ten GPUs uh, sharing RAM and a artist just using the, you know, piping into that viewport, kind of like a cloud service, well, or instead of having them locally in a workstation? Well, it comes down to what you're trying to achieve. They were in the Pixar sense. They were like, we could have like you know a farm of twenty GPUs. And I would dedicate it to this artist while he's working, so he has interactive viewport. Uh, okay. But that's not batching frames. Right. That's just for him viewport. to work. Right. Right. And I'm like, cool. Oh, that's so that cool. artist better make better not start watching YouTube. He's just he's, he's, he's moving lights and shadows are changing and everything's being computed across ten GPUs on the other side of the network. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's just streaming into his viewport. So they're feeding a that amount of, They're basically can feed the, the competing power to whatever artist needs it at the yep. time. This guy is doing hair today on the main character. Yep. You need like you know, you know GPU we got. Hey, burn! <laughs> <laughs> trying to talk here. Um, all right, I think the bird's trying to tell us something. Right. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thanks.